Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Revelation. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation, and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and four living creatures. And they fell on their faces behind the throne, and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing the glory, blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they, and where have they come from? I said to him, My Lord, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them. They will hunger no longer, nor thirst any more. Nor will the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and will guide them to springs of the water of life. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now Revelation 22:12 through 16. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons, and the murderers and the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things are the church, for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. All right, would you stand, please, as we uh, worship together? We're uh, Nathaniel, we're starting with 10,000 armies. <laughs> All right. into battle, no doubt in my mind, that my God is with me and victory is mine. I'll dance in the shadow of my enemy, cause God is my champion and he fights for me. Oh, God is my champion and he fights for me. Bigger the battle, greater my faith, there is no giant you cannot slay, cause you're stronger than ten thousand
They say these chains will never Sing 
you guys but I'm so grateful for our worship team look great up there they sound great you should be thankful too because they drown out the sound of my voice when I try to sing so so many things to be grateful for amen count our blessings we should focus upon those and not the challenges and the tribulations which confront all of us in our journey through this veil of tears I was thinking earlier today how grateful I am for not just our pastor, who's uh, a gift from God, but also his family. They work uh, to support him in this church behind the scenes every single day. Uh, Laura is always uh, there, uh, militating for this church in ways that most of us just don't even see. Uh, she's just a spark plug here. Uh, when I got here uh, this morning, Martha and I got here, the walks were already shoveled uh, because of Israel. Deacon Hunter's not able to be here today. They are in the happy circumstance of moving from their small upstairs apartment to uh, significantly improved circumstances out in Island City. So uh, he was not here to uh, run the soundboard. Uh, but Nathaniel uh, leaped in there to uh, fill his spot. So this entire family is just uh, devoted and committed to God, and I think we need to be appreciative of them. So what else is on your hearts? 
Any other praises of God's goodness or needs? Yes, Linda. Wow, how exciting. Thank you for that update. So uh, you may recall that we did pray for Wendy Chamberlain and her medical missionary team in Sierra Leone last week, and uh, those prayers were answered. I'm sure to no one's surprise, but happily nonetheless. Uh, Satan, of course, cannot allow that without interference, and he did so in the form of multiple vehicle challenges, breakdowns and whatnot, but the team prevailed nonetheless, and uh, God kept them in the palm of his hand and restored them back to their home village. Is that right? Okay, thank you for that update. What a happy thing. All right, what else? Prayer needs or praises? Yes, honey. All right, good. Thank you for that update. What else? Yes, Ken. Okay, well, we're distressed to hear that. We're grateful that you're in a position to be able to support them emotionally and hopefully spiritually as well. Anything else? Wow, okay. Yeah, that's a happy thing. Good. All right. We won't take the time to go down through the uh, prayer list point by point, but as always, we would encourage you to do so in your own times of private devotionals. Let us approach the throne of grace in prayer at this time. Almighty God, we do thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord. Every breath we take is a gift from you. We thank you for your protection of us, your provision for us. We thank you for the ability to pray in the certain knowledge that you do answer our prayers. Not always the way that we want or in the timing, but we know that your plan is perfect and your timing is perfect, and we accept that, Lord, and we're grateful for all that you do for us. This morning we do lift up our sister Carol to you, uh, this delightful, kind woman who's been such an integral part of this church for so long, uh, now is entering into a season of life which has its own challenges. We're grateful that we have access to medical care uh, that can help restore us to a modicum of health. And we're thankful especially for Carol's family uh, who's ready to uh, have prepared a place for her back home and is uh, prepared to assist her as she uh, moves forward. We're grateful for that. We do pray for continued and complete healing for our sweet sister and gratitude for her family that rallies around her. 
Father, we do pray for Diane's uh, sister, who's uh, very sick, Lord. And uh, we do pray for uh, strength for her and skill for the doctors. And we do pray for a, a good outcome. We're grateful for our brother Ken, who's in a position to support her in perhaps one of the most uh, needed and meaningful ways during this stage of her life. Father, we're so uh, grateful. We celebrate answered prayer for the medical team in Sierra Leone and uh, Wendy Chamberlain. So grateful for these brave, uh, godly, committed people uh, who are doing so much good in a place which is full of so much need. We thank you that you kept them safe during that time, that they were able to do good. Saw 1,200 people, tended them medically. Uh, there's uh, a positive development and perhaps an opportunity to start a church up there. And that despite uh, the barbs and the arrows of Satan, they were able to return safely. I'm so grateful to you for that, Lord. Lord, it's a, a happy news for Rebecca being able to transition into more suitable transportation. We're grateful that you kept her safe and the car running uh, during the time that she had to rely upon it. Father, we do lift up to you the unspoken prayer needs. They are legion, Lord. There are so many needs and so many hurts. Um, we pray that you would uh, keep Satan at bay and that you would use the trials which inevitably do intrude upon our lives uh, to grow us in the important, uh, the spiritual, and the eternal ways. Father, we do pray for a rich uh, blessing upon each and every one who's here, and we pray that each one will be fully spiritually fed uh, during the sermon to come. And the things we pray we do so in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, at this time, we do have a special presentation among the outreaches that this uh, church engages in. One of the most popular and fun is the Next Step Pregnancy Center uh, the baby bottles that we all get to fill up with uh, our spare change over the period of time, and that does tremendous good, uh, I'm sure perhaps uh, more than most of us know. And joining us this morning is the executive director of Next Step, Vonda. So Vonda, I would invite you to come forward and tell us about your exciting and happy program. Well, I would love to. Good morning. <laughs> And um, thank you so much for the opportunity to share about Next Step. Um, your baby bottle boomerang is about 30% of our funding, which um, is actually huge when you think about it. Because other than the baby bottle boomerang, we're only funded by private individuals or churches. We don't take any handouts from the government. We don't take any loans, anything like that. And that leaves us free to do exactly what the Lord calls us to do. And we've been serving Union County for over 30 years. So when I speak at churches or other organizations, I try to answer that main question, what do we do at Next Step? And in a nutshell, we impact generations by being the hands and feet of Jesus with the programs that we provide for those in Union County. So I'm going to give you a brief overview. <laughs> this is not all inclusive. Um, I want to respect the time that pastor has given me. <clears throat> One of our main requested services is our Earn While You Learn online educational program. So with Earn While You Learn, clients watch lessons on topics that interest them, and they earn what we call boutique bucks. Now, these it's in-house currency that they can spend in our in-house boutique. And I believe Laura has seen our boutique and so forth. It's amazing, and it's all because of the generosity of um, our supporters. So the lessons are about 20 minutes long, and they have an accompanying worksheet. And once they complete that, they earn three boutique bucks, which goes a very long ways in our boutique. Now, prior to COVID, clients would come into the center and watch these lessons COVID caused us to think outside the box, and we launched this program online. So we can now text the lessons or we can email, and then clients can watch them on their own time and their own convenience. And what has been just an amazing answer to prayer is we're able to reach so many more people with it being online, and that includes um, dads who work who can't come in. Um, males who are, you know, wanting to foster healthy relationships. So it's, it was been a very good thing um, to come out of COVID. So I just want to give God all the glory for that. Um, as it, there's over 300 lessons on topics that it's, this is not all of them, but it's uh, pregnancy, parenting and co-parenting, healthy relationships, fatherhood, finances, staying out of debt, 
finding a job, healing from abuse, depression and suicide, and we do have online Bible studies. So it, we try to cover almost every topic that we can. And what is nice about being online is that they're new, they're current, and they're fresh. They can earn things such as infant car seats, diapers and baby wipes, baby equipment and clothing, men and women's items. But one um, thing that is very um, in m much in demand is our gift cards. So we have Walmart gift cards, Safeway, Sinclair. Um, we even have some Ace Hardware and even a Starbucks, I believe. <laughs> but um, these are earned dollar for dollar. So they can basically watch three videos and earn a $10 Walmart gift card which would then allow them to purchase necessities that they can't get through our boutique. So another uh, free service that we offer is called our baby bundles. So our baby bundles are good sized boxes that are filled with necessities for baby up to one year. So we give those to moms in their third trimester or after baby's born, but we also partner with CHD, DHS, CHARM, which is Children and Recovering Mothers up at the hospital. So if you're a foster parent and you find yourself with an infant or a toddler up to size 2T, we will build these bundles specifically for that need. Uh, CHARM, which is, as I said, children and recovering mothers. The hospital finds themselves with um, women giving birth who don't have anything, and so we're able to provide that for them. We also have a relationship education program called First Step, and we believe that parents are the main educators of their children but we want to come alongside parents and support them. So what we do is we help to equip parents to build healthy relationships with their children and foster open communication. And then in turn, the parents can help their children and equip them to have healthy relationships. We have our post-abortion healing program, which is a confidential eight-week God-centered program that helps women walk through the healing process of abortion by allowing God's word to reveal truth, which brings healing and forgiveness. We have a memorial garden. I'm not sure if any of you have visited our memorial garden, but it's beautiful. Uh, our memorial garden is a place to remember babies who've moved to heaven as a re result of um, pregnancy loss, early infant loss, miscarriage, stillbirth, or abortion. And you can purchase uh, memorial plates for the garden at just $15. This garden is open 24-7. You can access it at any time. We are working on a new ministry, which is a reproductive and early infant loss ministry. We discovered that there is one baby born still every three months at Grand Ronde Hospital. And it's been on our heart to uh, minister to these women and families, just to walk with them through the heartache and the pain. And so we've been asking the Lord, you know, how can we do this? The Lord has brought us um, together with a family who has experienced loss. And um, they lost, about two years ago, they did lose um, one of their children. And God has placed it on their heart to do the same that we wanted to do. And so I'm asking if you would please pray for this ministry, um, that God would just... Um, Open the doors that he wants opened and bring those families um, that need that healing process and to walk with someone who's actually been through it. And that's been our heart's desire. We have a men's mentorship program, which is a one-on-one -on -one, uh, program. We have our first ever male mentors. So in the 30 years of serving Union County, we've not had any male advocates or male mentors. And it's on our heart, again, to support men, young fathers, um, men who do not have um, male role models in their life. And so um, as a result of Earn While You Learn going online, we're able to see more men. They'll come into the center, spend their bucks, want to get uh, more lessons. And then we ask, can we set you up with one of our male mentors? And um, most of the time they say yes. And so our mentors reach out to them and they meet them away from the center um, on their own terms, on their own times, whether it be a phone call or a text or, hey, let's go meet for coffee because it's so important for young men these days to have male mentors in their life. So that's just a brief overview of some of our programs. But what's most important is that we walk with people no matter where they are in life, we're there for them. 
We reflect the love of Jesus by serving others. We plant seed, water seed, and sometimes we get to harvest that seed. Um, we offer help, compassion, and hope to our community. And I would now like to read you a client story because I would like for you to hear from the client, not just myself. April 2020, I didn't expect to become pregnant in a pandemic, no less. I didn't expect to lose so much of the support system I had either. I had three other children, and no one had told me that I should think about my options. I felt like every time I reached out to my friends and family for help or encouragement, I received the opposite, reminders of how difficult it would be and how I was ruining my career. When I made the call to Next Step, I was in Montana and doubting myself. I just needed someone to talk to. So I called, and I didn't think anything would come of it. I spoke with Anne, and I cried a little because the only other person who didn't automatically doubt me was my dad. I made my baby a promise. I would give him the best chance at a good life that I could. And then if I didn't have a house and a different job by the time he came, I would make sure that he would have a place that would be able to provide those things for him. If I didn't have things in order, I would make a plan for adoption. I made small goals and accomplished them. It really helped talking to Anne. I would visit and we would talk. I would tell her my plans and then I tried to have them accomplished by the next time we spoke. I utilized several resources that she provided information and phone numbers for. My biggest worry before I had my baby was how I would get all the things I needed for my baby on the limited income I had at the time. The Earn While You Learn program was so awesome. Just knowing that there was help available to someone in my situation was so reassuring. Anne was always stopping by my work to check in to see how I was doing. And some people thought she was my grandma. <laughs> I think that's awesome. Um, after Monty was born, Anne continued to check up on me. After five weeks, my daughters, who I had not seen in two years, came to stay with me. Their dad had a change of heart and wanted me to see my children again. I had spent years praying for this chance. Anne continued to check on me and help me with resources. At that time, all five of us were living in a small pull-behind trailer. <clears throat> it was hard, but God provided a way out in the form of a carbon monoxide leak, a broken water heater, and a frozen water line. <laughs> we got into transitional housing and spent months looking for a rental. The girls went back to be with their dad. One day I decided on a whim to go and check in with the housing authority and let them know that I had been looking but nothing was available. That afternoon I found out there was a place and they wanted me to move in. Fast forward to August 2021. Monty is my little sunflower, the light of my life. My daughters and their dad and stepmom <clears throat> have moved to Legrand. We have a small house to live in. My life is far from perfect, but we have all we need. I just wanted the volunteers at Next Step to know that none of your work goes unnoticed and unappreciated. Thank you so much for all you do, not just for my family, but for the, every family in this community. Thank you. And to bring it to date, she now has custody of her three daughters along with her son, and they live in a three-bedroom apartment. They're all doing well, and Anne still checks on her, and they have a very close relationship. <clears throat> And so that's what it means to be a client advocate at Next Step. Our motto is we walk with families and people. We do. We'll walk with you. And now I have to share this. We are actually operating at bare bones with client advocates, so much so that I am putting out the plea everywhere we go. If any of this story spoke to your heart and you would like to talk about becoming a client advocate, I would like to invite you to Next Step to get a tour to talk to our advocates so that we can share the joy of, of advocating and what we do at Next Step. There is also a couple volunteer books over here on the table that'll kind of give you um, an idea of what we do. Um, we're trusting the Lord, we're not panicking, but we are operating on bare bones. So um, I would like to thank you so much for your prayers. That is first and foremost our need because we actually are in a, a battle in every way, shape and form. And again, thank you for your financial support. Um, and I do have to apologize. I'd like to stay and answer questions and meet you, but I have another ministry commitment at noon, so I have to leave. But thank you so much for um, your prayers and the invite to share with you.
Thank you, Vonda. Before you leave, let us say a prayer for you and for next step. Lord, we thank you for this ministry, and we thank you for Vonda's willingness to come and um, share news about it with us. We pray that you would continue to um, bless it and that you would uh, provide both through the giving of the churches in um, the valley and also just through your um, orchestration of events and moving the hearts of people who may hear about the ministry. We pray that you would uh, also um, spread the news of this ministry to those who may be in need of its services and that they would reach out uh, and um, contact Next Step and that you would change hearts and save, save lives because of the uh, ministry of Next Step. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> So I got a text message from Craig yesterday while I was at a uh, basketball game. Maybe it was Friday. Um, saying, so next step is coming on Sunday to talk. I looked at my wife and said, is next step coming on Sunday to talk? And she assured me they were. Uh, so it's actually good be that I shortened my sermon from what I had planned because... Um, a, I wouldn't have gotten through any uh, more than I'm going to get through here today, and B, I was not ready to s get through more. Uh, but we are going to be looking at um, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18, and uh, go uh, down into chapter 5 uh, through verse 4. So as you may know, um, chapter 5 begins what is commonly called the Sermon on the Mount, uh, where Jesus gives uh, the Beatitudes and then uh, talks about kind of this uh, proper um, interpretation of the law and uh, then uh, speaks about our reliance upon him. Um, difficult passage to preach on, uh, but one which holds... Uh, many applications, and so we pray that uh, the Lord will use us in each of our lives. Let's uh, read through the passage. Well, we'll read through uh, verse 1 of chapter 5, make a few comments on that, and then I will talk about um, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 5. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, that is Jesus, saw Two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left the nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat, with um, Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and they immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all Syria, and they brought to him all who were taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, um, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and uh, Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And when he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word today and that we would um, have hearts that are receptive to its message. Amen. So here you remember G from last week that Jesus had just, um, has, well, I say just, uh, he has uh, uh, begun his ministry with his baptism, gone um, at the um, uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness um, and been tested by Satan there. And then in verse 12 uh, of chapter 4, we read now, when he heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. So 
there seems to be about a year's period of time between the end of um, verse 11 and the beginning of verse 12. We're not sure exactly how much time that is, but if you re, um, flip to uh, John chapter 1, um, there you'll see that um, John makes uh, some comments about Jesus after his baptism that the uh, synoptic gospels do not discuss. And one of the things that John does is he points some of his disciples to Jesus, one of them being Andrew, um, who then goes and gets Peter and uh, brings him to Jesus. And so this is not the first encounter that Andrew and Peter have with Jesus. They had an encounter with him uh, somewhere, apparently, in Judea. Um, and then they were there when uh, Jesus turned the water into wine, and then also at his uh, first appearance at the Passover, I should say his first appearance after the inauguration of his ministry at the Passover, where he cast um, the money changers out of the temple. Okay, so all of that is kind of background for uh, where we come here, and we see that uh, Jesus then is um, walking by the sea, and he sees Peter and Andrew, and he also sees um, James and John, and he calls both of them, and uh, both sets of brothers have the same reaction. They drop everything they are doing, and they follow Jesus. And so really that is the um, choice that lies before all of us. Are we going to drop everything else for Jesus or are we going to cling to those temporal things and refute his call? We see there in verse 23 through 25 here that Jesus, um, according to uh, Matthew, is fulfilling. He claims that he is fulfilling and uh, Matthew claims that he is f fulfilling by implication and um, Jesus actually uh, explicitly says he is fulfilling passages from Isaiah. If you flipped with me to um, Luke chapter 7, um, verses 21 through 23, uh, we see, um, go back up a little bit, the, verse 18, it says, And the disciples of John reported to him about these things, um, that is, about all the things that Jesus had been doing. And summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is coming, or do we look for someone else? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the one who is coming, or do we look for someone else? At that time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he granted sight uh, to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling over me. So here, by, again, by implication, Matthew says that um, this one who he introduced as uh, Jesus the Christ or Jesus the Messiah is fulfilling the scriptures that were um, written concerning him, specifically um, in Isaiah 61.1 and Isaiah 35 verses 4 through 6. And you can uh, read those uh, passages um, later in the week, and I would encourage you to do that. Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, and Isaiah 61.1. But before we um, leave this passage, I would make one note here. If you look in verse 34, or I'm sorry, verse 24, Luke actually made reference to this as well. And uh, quoting Jesus, he says, um, they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Now there were 
There are some in our society who would say, well, you know, you had these unsophisticated people who um, really when someone was afflicted with a disease, they just assumed that that was an evil spirit. Well, Matthew puts a lie to that assertion because here he says, no, there were all sorts of people. There were people who had epilepsy. They went into fits. People um, who were like that, uh, everyone around them understood it was not a demon who was doing this. But there were other people who were thrown into fits and convulsions, foaming at the mouth, who they said, no, this is not epilepsy. This is something else. This is demonic influence. And so, contrary to what these people would say, that uh, these people in um, the ancient cultures were kind of blinded to science and to an understanding of uh, anatomy and physiology, really, the people in our society are the ones who are blind, not to anatomy and physiology, but to spiritual battles. And here there were real spiritual battles going on and there were some people who were possessed by demons and Jesus healed them. Okay, now we move on to, um, from that issue into chapter 5 and look at um, the first two Beatitudes that Jesus discusses here. Um, Verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. My sheet fell down, and I have to get it. I didn't think I'd need it, but I need it. Um, If you'll see on your little handout here, um, I gave you kind of the parallel of the uh, two passages from Matthew and from Luke. So here... um, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you look at the passage in Luke, he says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. So this word blessed is kind of a strange word to us. We think blessed, what does that mean? We kind of, I'm not sure what blessed means in English, um, but if really in the Greek, it kind of has this connotation of happiness. Now, again, in English, the concept of happiness or being happy is kind of glib and um, surfacy, and we're like we're happy if we have a candy bar or we're, you know, um, happy if uh, we have a snow day and we don't have to go to school. Well, That's not really the biblical concept. The biblical concept is um, kind of a state of contentment and joyousness, particularly related to uh, the blessings of God. And so here, yes, it is happy, um, but it is a deeper sense of joy and joy. satisfaction than we typically think of when we think of the concept or the emotion of being quote-unquote happy. But there are, um, this is where we get our word happy from, and so to translate it, happy um, uh, are the poor in spirit would be a good translation with the caveats that I put in place. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We uh, talked, uh, well, we didn't talk, but um, had Brandon read that passage from Revelation where Jesus talks about having um, a kingdom and establishing his kingdom, and we will be participants in that. And if you uh, look at your cross-references, if you have the New American Standard Bible, um, there in verse 3, it gives you a Uh, cross-reference for uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 29, where Jesus says that he has been granted a kingdom, and he tells his disciples that they will be um, participants in that kingdom, and specifically they will sit on 12 thrones governing the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Jesus 
um, is saying here that the poor in spirit are those who will be members of his kingdom. Now the question arises, what is um, this phrase, the poor in spirit, and how are we to interpret that? There are some in our um, In Christian circles, I use that term kind of loosely in this uh, case, who would um, assert that really what Jesus is saying here is um, that he is speaking specifically of those who are poor, that is, physically, monetarily poor. Nathaniel, I'm going to need a drink of water. I have a cup over there somewhere, please. <clears throat> But we will get into this uh, when we look at a, another passage here in a second. It is a difficult argument to make that um, Jesus is saying that the poor are intrinsically good and that the quote-unquote rich are intrinsically bad. And uh, part of this is revealed in the fact that when people say this, they're thinking of the poor as kind of like Marx thought of the um, proletariat, that they're like the working class and they're, you know, they're struggling to make ends meet, living from paycheck to paycheck, and um, because of that, God has a particular place in his heart for them. Well, it may be the fact, it may be true that God has a particular place in his heart for those who are struggling, but it is um, that is not what this passage is talking about. And if you um, look at the, sorry, the word here that Jesus uses um, for poor, he is basically talking about those who are beggarly. They are without any resources. This is the same word that is used when um, Jesus describes the poor widow who gave up the last two copper coins that she had and put them in the offering box at the temple. And in essence, what was she doing? She was throwing her entire future upon the Lord and trusting him for it, not clinging to those coins and thinking that somehow she was going to eke out a livelihood by retaining those. There was an um, uh, individual who uh, was in leadership in this group that I was on staff with. The group was called um, Campus Ambassadors. It was the uh, basically the um, conservative Baptist equivalent of Campus Crusade, and it had at the time, I think, 20 ministries um, around the country. And this individual, I, in retrospect, I don't even think he was a believer, but he asserted that really, he wouldn't have put it in this way, but that Marx was right, that the poor were righteous and the wealthy were unrighteous. But when he did this, it kind of, he was just exchanging one set of um, presumptuous assumptions for another set, right? So the rich are kind of presumptuous and they, that they assume here, you can see this um, in Luke 6.24, I put that on your notes, um, that somehow their wealth is a sign of either their own uh, intellectual prowess, their hard work, their beauty, their intellect, whatever those things are. That they attribute their wealth to themselves. And somehow, God is obligated, because of their wealth, to treat them with deference. That is what um, the temptation of wealth typically comes down to. But this guy who asserted that really the poor were um, righteous and the wealthy unrighteous was just had his own pretensions. 
but his pretensions were that he was somehow enlightened and understood really kind of the underlying socio-economic current of our society and kind of the uh, misinterpretations um, of the scripture uh, that most of Christianity had um, embraced and that somehow because of his enlightened status God was obligated to treat him with deference. Well, he was just rich in a different way than a person um, like uh, Bill Gates is rich. He was rich in this knowledge that he had that he had convinced himself was somehow um, valuable and removed him from the need to be poor in spirit. So this term poor in spirit, we said blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. Um, Jesus uses similar language. Let's see if I can find it. Um, maybe I put it on your notes. Wait a second. Oh, I know where it is. Uh, let's look at um, Luke 6.20. I believe that's where it is. Sorry, I should have written this down. Nope, wrong passage. That's it. Um, well, let me paraphrase it for you. Um, Jesus said... Uh, to his disciples one time, remember the um, children started to come to him to be uh, blessed. People were bringing their kids to be blessed, and the disciples said, "No, no, the uh, the Messiah is too busy. You can't, you know, can't bother him with this." And Jesus um, rebuked them and said, "Allow the children to come to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these." Now. Was Jesus saying that children were intrinsically good and that therefore they deserved to go into the kingdom of heaven? Any parent here could attest to the fact that that is not true. Okay, little Esther, who's sitting somewhere around here, is only, what, 16 months old and yeah, has a sin nature. I will attest to that fact. She's only been with us three days. Yes, I'm talking about you. Um, so, what is Jesus saying? Well, Jesus is saying that in, um, children are willing, again, to cast their entire future upon the benevolence of their parents. And they naturally understand that they cannot eke out a living on their own. They are dependent upon their parents. It was interesting back in the day when really uh, we were going through significant financial hardships and there were times where like I had five dollars in my wallet and that was all the money I had for food um, and had no prospects for any more money. Abriel, at the time, I think she was like seven or something, uh, she was talking to her older siblings, and she goes, my dad can buy me anything I want. Well, I, I was kind of dumbstruck by that, um, because A, it wasn't true, but uh, B, she um, didn't want anything. But she had this confidence in my ability to do that, that just gave her happiness. And so that is what Jesus is saying there. Really, that attitude is indicative of one who is willing to come to God and say, I cannot do this on my own. I am in need of you. And the person who is poor in spirit um, is the person who comes to God and says, God, I am bankrupt morally. 
I am a rebel who is deserving of death. I cannot pay any ransom for my life. But I ask that you save me anyway. That is the one who receives the kingdom of God. Now, if you think, really, you sure it's not more of that um, emphasis on kind of your social status? Well, look at the next verse in verse 4. It says, blessed are those who mourn, or happy are those who mourn. Does that not seem paradoxical to you? Happy are those who mourn? How could that be? Um, for they shall be comforted. What is Jesus saying here? Is he saying all who mourn are comforted? No, we can look around and see that is not the case. I may have used this illustration before, but I was in uh, the emergency room of the hospital in Page, Arizona, and um, this group came in um, because somebody... Uh, in their group of vacationers had gotten injured out on the lake and there were two girls who were uh, there in the waiting room. One of them used the opportunity to call home. When she called home, um, someone on the other end of the line informed her that her mother had died. And I was sitting there and witnessed this girl go into total meltdown because she was staring into an abyss of hopelessness and there was no comfort. And that is the natural state of people apart from God when they mourn, as um, Paul says, they mourn without hope. So it cannot be the fact that Jesus is saying all who mourn um, will be comforted. Then who are the people who mourn and are comforted? Well, I think that they fall into two categories. Um, the one we will look at first is given in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. That would be 1 Corinthians. I need 2 Corinthians. Um, here Paul is uh, speaking. He says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, that is my previous letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, sorrowful but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God in order that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. So here, a mourning that leads to repentance then results in blessing or happiness. If we are mournful over our sins, and come to God and say, we have sinned, we need your forgiveness, then the blessing of happiness comes to us. So that's the first case. The second case um, is in, found in John chapter 16, verses 19 through 20. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus um, knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, Are you deliberating together about this, that I said, A little while, and you will not behold me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. Look at the um, right side of your handout, and you will see uh, there in Luke 6.25 says, Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. After the crucifixion of Jesus, 
his uh, religious enemies were laughing. They thought they had um, won the final victory and the upper hand. But Jesus is um, saying to his disciples, at first it will seem like everything is hopeless and you will be sorrowful and mourn. But your sorrow will be turned to joy. And we see this uh, manifest, if you flip back a um, few pages to uh, Luke chapter 24, uh, verses, uh, beginning at verse 36. So here you had these uh, two disciples of Jesus. We don't, um, haven't heard much about these two, except they were walking from Jerusalem uh, to Emmaus, which was about um, seven miles away. And Jesus appears to them, and they, at the end of the day, they realize it's Jesus, so they rush back, and they find the disciples, and while they're telling them the story, this is where we pick it up. And while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst, and they were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you um, see that I have. And while they still could not believe it for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? While they could not believe it for joy and marveling. Those who mourned were blessed because they were comforted, comforted beyond their wildest dreams. And so it is with us when things um, seem to arise that would uh, um, contradict God's will and where people stand up in opposition to the work of the gospel and we are crushed by that, discouraged, mourn over that, we should use that morning to turn to God and say, God, redeem this situation. And watch to see how he operates. And it is the testimony of history that he routinely turns mourning to comfort even when all seems lost. Now we may not see it, but those who come behi behind us will. And so take this passage um, to heart. And even when you see things that break uh, your heart and break your spirit, in your mourning, turn to God and ask him to make it a right and to glorify his son in doing so. Now there is one last application of this passage I think we can take if we flip, uh, if you flip with me to Revelation chapter 3, verses 13, I'm sorry, 14 through 19. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I, were, I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Notice here, even 
we within the church can um, assume this pompous attitude that we have arrived, we are rich, we have our theology in order, we sing the right songs. I kind of think we do sing the right songs as a side note, no, no criticism, okay? Um, but if that is what we are relying upon, then we are deceiving ourselves. The Pharisees, in many regards, had a better understanding of the scriptures, um, at least technically speaking, they could recite more of the scriptures than any of us could ever hope to recite. But they thought that that made them righteous before God. It's interesting, Jesus says, do what they say, but do not be like them. And so we need to make sure that when we are um, engaged in our Christian fellowship and engaged in the study of the Bible, that it, it does not become a mere intellectual exercise. It does not become an issue that kind of builds up our pride because, again, we understand the scriptures. But it is an um, exercise in nourishment and in renewal that leads us to ever um, advancing levels of becoming like Jesus. Not through our own efforts, because we have to understand that we are poor, but through that working of his Holy Spirit. So let us pray that the Lord uses these passages um, to encourage us that we would continually adopt an attitude that we are poor and wretched before a holy God and that we would place our hope in that God so that when we mourn, we look to him for our comfort. Lord, we thank you and praise you that you are the Messiah, the one who came and preached uh, good news to the poor. We pray that we would have hearts that are um, open uh, to your teaching and that we would uh, be quick to repent from our sins and that we would allow you to make us rich. We pray all these things for your glory and um, look forward to the fulfillment of your kingdom. Amen. Please stand for our closing hymn.
Amen. Well, thank you for coming. Um, take time to greet one another. Thank you for traversing the uh, snowy streets, and we will see you next week, Lord willing. Oh, wait, before you go, um, I need my phone for this, uh, not to take a picture. Oh, we need two things. We need two things. We had a birthday, but uh, someone didn't show up when we normally do birthdays. Rachel, you're going to be embarrassed if we mention it's your birthday. <laughs> it's Rachel's birthday, so we should sing happy birthday to Rachel. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rachel. Happy birthday to you. I know the rhythm of that last part, so I can like lead it, but that's it. Okay, so what I was going to say besides that and, um, was on August 25th, 26th, and 27th, so the weekend before Memorial Day, we have reserved Camp Elkanah to have a family camp, okay? And um, I uh, talked to Sunny about kind of making arrangements for that, and she said, well, how am I going to make arrangements for that? All the women are going to be cooking and all that stuff. No, there will be no women cooking, okay? Um, because it is family camp, so we're going to ask the camp staff, we're going to pay the camp staff there to do the cooking so that the women don't have to do that, all right? Um, so I encourage you to put that on your calendars so that you have that reserved. Kids, do not let your parents uh, forget to put that on the calendars because they have like a rope course and they have all sorts of fun stuff at Camp Elkanah, okay? Um, and I think it'll be a good time of fellowship and it would be an opportunity where you could invite um, maybe someone who's considering the church uh, to come up to that, okay? So uh, put that on your calendars even now. We will have that in the bulletin. Uh, if it's not in there today, it'll be in there next week. Okay, thank you.